Yep. I serve an entire congregation that made the decision to walk away from the United Methodist Church. Here's their story. Welcome to FaithCast, a Faith in the Forest ministry. Be sure to hit that notification bell to stay up to date on great new content. Now, here is your host, Pastor Keith. Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of FaithCast, where we share the truth and love without pushing religion. So if you saw the title or the thumbnail of this video and that's why you clicked on because you're curious about an entire congregation leaving the United Methodist Church, I'm going to tell you the whole story. In fact, we're going to do this as a series, which is probably going to take a few weeks and we're going to hopefully try to help some other churches. So let me lay a few ground rules before we really get started. Number one, this series that we're about to start is not meant to be an attack or a belittling or anything condescending or negative really about the United Methodist denomination. It, we're, we're all brought together you know, by God's love and we're, we're called to lift each other up. But at the same time, we need to share the truth in love. And there's some truth that just needs to be told. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it by sharing the story that our congregation walked through. Now, secondly, as this is not meant to be an attack on the congregation or on the denomination, is also not meant to be an attack on any of the individuals who still serve in the United Methodist Church. I'm friends with some of the colleagues. I'm friends with folks who I have relatives. Many of us in our congregation have relatives who still attend United Methodist Churches. I our mountain bike ministry uh, works hand in hand with a United Methodist youth camp. There are really good people in the denomination doing their best to serve God. But this is the big reason. Our little congregation walked away from the United Methodist Church and ended up becoming independent. And in the midst of this walk, we now meet every week at a Grange building. And if you don't know what the Grange is, it started back in the 1860s as basically a lobbyist group for farmers, for rural America, when industrialization was really taking off. And there was this fear that, that rural America was going to get left behind and forgotten. And so this big lobbyist group formed. And to this day, the Grange is still around and it defends the, the needs and the rights of rural America. And as I was preaching in this Grange Hall and in our worship services, which we offer online here on the same Faith in the Force channel, we're going through the, the book of Proverbs. And I was looking through some of the Proverbs and it was talking about being righteous and, and speaking the truth. And I, I realized that with everything that's going on with the denomination, there's a very real fear that some of the smaller rural and i don't want to say just rural because there there are some smaller united methodist congregations in more urban areas that are on the decline that as the denomination is building up towards this big split that's going to happen between these two entities and and i'm not here to defend or say which one is good or bad or the other that's irrelevant to me right now what in different stances i could defend where i stand on it but Right now, I'm concerned that many of the small, rural and community urban churches are going to fall through the cracks, that they're going to get left behind, that they're gonna be forgotten. They're gonna be an afterthought. That's really the best way to say it. I, my fear is that they're going to be an afterthought as this big split, this big chism happens in the denomination and I want to be a voice for them and so let me lay this out very quickly in the few years that I was a pastor for the United Methodist denomination I served on some capacity as a pastor or an associate pastor in seven different rural churches during that time I sat with two congregations and discussed the idea of what it would be for them to leave the denomination, to just walk away. And I'm going to get to why here in just a minute. 
I also served on the board of directors of the youth camp, a rural youth camp. And in every one of those examples that I have, uh, experiences that I have in my life, I saw where the rural churches are very, very disconnected from the larger annual conferences of the denomination. Now, in different parts of the country, this could be somewhat different. Uh, but in the area, the part of the United States that I serve, this is very, very real. And it's a concern for me. And so let's get into a little bit of the story of what happened, why we left the denomination. And then in episodes going on, we're going to talk about the Book of Discipline and where churches stand, what you can do, what you can't do, and what to be prepared for as things start to unfold with the denomination. Okay, let's get to the story of how this one congregation decided to leave the denomination. There's some details that I'm going to leave out for now that I will be bringing up in later episodes because I want to discuss them in more detail, but let's just get to the nuts and bolts of what was happening right here. I was called in to be an associate pastor for this little rural church in a dying community and there was barely any congregation left. Maybe on a good day, 20 people might be there, maybe. And, and really that represented about four families. So at the time, this church, now I want you to think about this. Think about where you're, if you're part of a United Methodist church and think about where you are financially, I want you to let you know where this church was. When we first came in, I came in with two senior pastors. This church had well over $100,000 in an account based on oil money from way back in the day. And they had this huge, huge church right here, right? It was built in the 1870s. I think it was 1872 that this thing was built back with big oil and lumber money from Western Pennsylvania. And now it was down to, you know, basically a couple families trying to keep it open. And out of this over $100,000 amount that they had in this account, they were drawing $800 a month out of it just to try and pay the bills. I mean, they were just squandering that money just to try and pay the bills. When I came in with these two senior pastors, they flipped the whole idea of the church upside down, tried to do a Saturday night contemporary service. Everything was totally different. Did away with the Sunday morning service for a reason. I won't get into the details of that right now. But needless to say, the experiment failed miserably and the church imploded even more and it it actually sped up the death of this church and and i say that to to share that in the aspect of everything that's going on with both the last year of this pandemic and churches being shut down and then the idea that the denomination is about to have this huge split is also going to speed up the death of some churches if the congregations aren't proactive and make decisions about it. So a couple years went on, we just limped along with this church. It ended up that I was now there alone as the only pastor. And actually I brought in a, a wonderful young lady who served as an associate with me for a while. She's really more a partner than an associate. And we, got to looking at, at what we should be doing as a church and, and not worrying about any of the other stuff, just, just what God called us to do to serve the community. And as we started to do this, the congregation actually started to grow. We, we started to bring people in and I was thinking, wow, we're going to, you know, we're going to turn things around here. You know, we're not doing it the way we thought we were going to do it with this weird Saturday night service and everything, but, but just being faithful to God and, and listening to the people, the community, I thought, wow, we're, we're, I think, you know, we're onto something here. God is really leading us in a direction. And then we had a couple financial hits with this big building and they weren't cheap to fix. And when we got to looking at a couple of the problems that were wrong with the building and we had to have a couple experts brought in who had to come in from far away, right? Because the people who can work on these big buildings typically don't live in small little rural communities. And so they came in from the nearest city, bigger city. and. 
started assessing the building and really they were very truthful i mean they they shared the they shared the truth and love with us they said here's where your building's at here's why you had these problems here's why you're gonna have these other problems here's the price tag to start fixing this building and it was an unbelievable amount of money to us i mean to some bigger churches you know if that was in the middle of pittsburgh yeah they'd probably just be you know doing a fundraiser writing a couple checks maybe take a loan out and they would fix the building up um in a dying little post oil boom town in western pa there was no money to of that amount that was going to start fixing that building and so the congregation had to start making some hard choices and in their conversations and this was this was the church leadership this wasn't the pastor or the denomination or the district superintendent coming in and telling them you know what they should be doing this was the congregation going look we've been called to serve our community we've been called to be obedient to the great commission and we've been doing that and and now because of this building we have to take funds that should be going to ministry and we're just going to try and keep this building open for a little bit longer and that's not what god has called us to and so they had a very very long conversation and it went on for a couple different meetings they went back and forth we weighed the pros and the cons and they decided that they needed to let go of the building and this is the very first important thing to think about because in the book of discipline the local church does not own their building it is held in trust by the denomination and in fact many local churches in fact the other one the other congregation that i sat with who thought about they wanted to leave the denomination the only reason they made the decision to stay was because the district superintendent came in and said well if you guys leave we take your building and they that building really is a centerpiece of the community and they didn't want to you know, let that building be demolished or destroyed or sold off and and so they decided to to stay on and, and i know that's where a lot of churches are at right now they, they hold on to that building as an identity this congregation said not only is this building not really our identity of who we are it's actually keeping us from doing the ministry god has called us to do so they had a couple more meetings. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that has to be talked about in this. And they went through the possible ideas. Do they just go off on their own? Do they seek the idea of staying as a United Methodist congregation, but not having that building, just turning the building over to the denomination, let the denomination do what they will with it. And they also had a parsonage. They tried to sell to the people who were renting it at the time, but Sadly, the gentleman um, who was living there passed away and the wife decided then that she didn't want it. So now they were sitting on the building. That's another story for later on. Um, cause, and and you want to come back for that episode because yeah, my wife and I actually got served court papers through the denomination. That's brotherly love right there. But that's a story for later. So they went and had another meeting. The district superintendent came in, talked about the different options of where they could go and they asked could we just stay as a local congregation can can the denomination just help us reorient where we're at and so we can meet and based on what the district superintendent told them was if they want to start over and so this is where you might be is if you want to start over without your building and just maintain as a united methodist church then you have to have an entirely new charter you have to take all of the finances you have and give them to the denomination you will no longer have control of them because technically you won't be that church anymore you have to start over from scratch with zero and decide where you're going with it and this was part of the conversation that was really hard for the local congregation and in fact i know there's a lot of anger there was some <sighs> There were a couple congregations or a couple conversations where I had to sort of calm people down a little bit and try and put this back in perspective because with what the, they were told through the district superintendent that is the stance of the denomination, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just telling you this is what was told to this congregation. And and it was really the, it, it was the straw that broke the camel's back was 
this local little rural congregation that was doing the very best they could was told that they would have to turn over any and all funds that they had to the denomination and the annual conference these were the words was please don't worry this money will be used for very good because this money will be taken and used to do a church plant to start a new church in an inner city urban area it's so which doing urban church planning is a fantastic thing but when you have a congregation sitting there ready to do God's work and you're telling them, eh, you're on your own, we're going to take your money and go start a church somewhere else, they really took that to heart and were extremely offended by it. And that was really the final straw, as I said, that they just went, well, then there's no reason for us to have the denomination. In fact, they started to say, and I, I have to be honest, I've said it myself, that why bother paying the franchise tag then? I mean, that's really, it's a franchise fee to use the United Methodist name. Why bother? And so they, they came up with the money on their own and started going through the paperwork. And they asked me if I would stay and help. So I resigned as the United Methodist pastor and I helped them go through all of the paperwork and all of the legal aspects, got the lawyers, and went through the process of starting our own independent, I, I hate saying non-denominational, but you know, we're not affiliated with anyone, uh, church. We have our own 501c3. And here's what's really interesting. We struggled, and, and we got that church to start to grow a little bit. Got a few new families in, like I said, some things were happening, and then then this hard decision, when they made the decision to go ahead and go off on their own, by the time they got the paperwork, at least in order where we could actually go and start and got some insurance so we recovered, you know, all the legal stuff that has to happen. They kicked off their first service on, it was like the September 11th weekend of 2016. And we were meeting in a little banquet hall in this restaurant. And within three months, we had outgrown the banquet hall. People just started to come. And they, they, it was weird. They wouldn't come to that big giant red brick building, but we were meeting in a banquet hall and really still following the same, pretty much the same doctrine as the United Methodist. I mean, there's a few non-essential doctrinal items that I, you know, because of my Baptist seminary background, I... I hold a little differently. We'll talk about that in a future episode. But we started growing and then we had to move. And so we met with a members of the volunteer fire department and we were meeting on Sunday mornings at the fire department and the church continued to grow. And, and I'm not gonna say that we were growing completely healthy though. And that's something to be aware of if you think about going out on your own. We were growing, but we weren't as healthy as we should have been. And, and really, as the leaders of the church, we needed to, to be aware of that and try to slow things down a little bit. You never want to step on people's heart to serve God and to do ministry, but you, you want to make sure you're all on the same page and, and you're moving together and really following God. And, and so we weren't completely doing that. And then the relationship with the fire department was really hard because, not in a bad way, but we're meeting on Sunday mornings, and that's the time, same time that these volunteer firemen are coming in to work on all the equipment because that's their time to be able to okay yes as a pastor i would love for them to have stopped for like an hour and come up and you know had worship go to church and then go back but you know you can't fault them they're they're giving of themselves to the community so we were sort of in the way of them trying to do their sunday morning uh, work on the equipment and we got invited to to move to a Grange Hall, which is actually in the middle of the National Forest. I mean, we are really surrounded by trees, absolutely surrounded by trees. And it, that did break up the congregation a bit. Some folks didn't want to go up there. And so the, the congregation got a little smaller again. That was okay because the people who went elsewhere were still able to do the ministries that God had laid on their heart. And I'm never i don't care where people go to church i just want them to be going to church and serving god and and each one of those folks that went to different places you know there were a couple people that wanted to stay with the united methodist 
uh, denomination they found other United Methodist churches to go to and they are very active in those churches. I don't have a hard feeling towards anybody from that congregation. I love hearing about the work they're doing at other churches. But for the congregation, the core group that stayed with us, we are healthy right now. And, and I mean, we're doing this. We are in the middle of the national forest where there shouldn't be any people and we don't even have phone service at the Grange Hall, let alone internet. So we have a different location that we're able to use at no cost to the church. I mean, God has just been good with us. We have this neat little studio set up and we're now doing basically three services a week. We do Faithcast, which you're watching. We do an online service and which we do in a little bit different way. It's not just a camera sitting in the back of the church and which are offered here online and we do our live service and we're doing ministry I mean, we have this this vision where we're going and so it's been absolutely spectacular of where we're at with things right now now in the coming weeks i want to share some of the details that many and i say many very i don't know um conservatively to use the word many because having served in seven different rural churches and having come from another a different rural church when I first came into all this there are so many people in these smaller churches that have no idea what's even going on at the higher levels beyond their own pew and and, and you know part of that's on them uh, to not be involved if you know you go to the United Methodist Church you should be aware of what's going on in the denomination and many people don't and many people have no idea what's going to be happening down the road in fact i believe a lot of people in the congregation or in the denomination themselves aren't exactly sure what's going to be happening when this split happens because there's a lot of different possibilities that i've heard thrown out there of which way they're actually going to go with this which could make things even harder for the smaller rural churches that at times have trouble finding a pastor at all and now there's going to be different elements which will unite churches with pastors and who has more of a conservative belief or a liberal belief. And, and and I don't want any of these local churches that have an opportunity to, to serve God and do ministry to just be left behind. So that's my message for today. That's that's the beginning of how we became the chapel at TDU Creek. I'm going to share more of it as we go in to future episodes. And I'm going to talk about the Book of Discipline and what it meant for us as United Methodist Church and how, you know, how those rules because a church still has to have structure and and how some of that affects us now and let me share this we paid a franchise fee of and ours wasn't very much um it was about five thousand dollars a year that we were paying for the the franchise tag or the apportionment they call it they've called it different things over the years and we look at that now that is less like we pay we're using less of that right now to pay our rent and utilities for the year and here's what's really cool our rent is being paid to another nonprofit organization so our, our rent is getting this double blessing because not only do we get to have a place to safely and, and comfortably meet for worship and to do outreach anytime we want but then the organization, the Grange that we're paying to is able to help you take that, our rent money and use it to support um, rural programs and, and the voice of rural America in both our state and federal levels. So it's, it, it's pretty cool of where God has led us. So stick with us in upcoming episodes as we talk about, um, you know, I, I've, I've contemplated writing a book on all of this and and calling it the death of a denomination why the united methodist church doesn't have a prayer and and i don't mean that in a bad negative way but the denomination as a whole is very very broken and i pray for each and every individual who's involved in all of it and i pray even harder for those who are either defending or are just blind to how broken the denomination is and and I, I pray for for each and every one of you. And, and I will do my best to share the truth and love and answer any questions I can. So if you have any questions or comments, leave them 
leave them below. I'll do my best to to look up the answers if I don't have them or to answer them in, in future episodes. I don't know how many episodes we will have on this, you know, the story of us leaving the United Methodist Church, but that's how it all started. That's how we got where we are. And other than that, join us next week for another episode of the United Methodist Church in rural America. So, all right, take care. God bless.